Hi there everyone, welcome back to Objectivity. Today we're joined by Helen Arney, physics expert, entertainer, educator, lots of different things. I don't really know what to call you. Here's a little clip of her doing her thing. Now, usually when special guests like Helen come to the Royal Society, we like to surprise them and show them something they weren't expecting. But you had a very specific request. There was someone you wanted to know more about. Yeah, because I hosted an event at the Royal Society uh, last year, which was about women in science. And a name kept coming up that I had never heard before. And I wanted to find out about her because she was a physicist. She was an inventor. She was someone who studied at Cambridge University. And that was at a time when she studied all the same things as everyone else did. She came very high in her class, but she wasn't awarded a degree, she got a kind of certificate, but she wasn't allowed a degree because she was a woman. But she still went on to become the first female member of the uh, Institute of Electrical Engineers. Uh, and yet, she was not allowed to become a fellow of the Royal Society. Are you going to tell her the name? Come on, what is that? Uh, it's Hertha Ayrton. <laughs> her Hertha Ayrton. <laughs> I really know very little about her apart from uh, what's on her Wikipedia page. So hopefully I can find out some things that I didn't know before okay. and, and weren't on that page. <laughs> okay, now unfortunately because you've given us some advance warning, yeah. Keith has gone to town. Yeah, he and really has, has. He's dug up lots of stuff. Here she is, Hertha Ayrton, there's a picture of her. In her laboratory. Yes. Looking very sciencey. Oh, I desperately wanted a laboratory like that mm. when I was little. She's written this report about what, electrical arcs. These are glowing reviews. I mean, the key question that all these reviewers are asked is, should this paper be published in Philosophical Transactions? And they're all saying yes, in full, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No modifications were necessary, yes. Yeah. She got it all right. There is some criticism, mm. fair's fair. The style was a bit diffuse. I think they're saying she's a bit wordy. I think they're saying she didn't necessarily always cut to the chase, yeah. but oh, yeah, yeah. that's just writing style, isn't okay, it? Okay, yeah, yeah. Let's get to this paper. Here we have Philosophical Transactions from 1902. Here's the start of the paper Great. by Hertha Ayrton. Communicated by Professor J. Perry. If you weren't a fellow, you'd send your paper to a fellow and they would present it to the organisation. Okay. Just right. a, a formality. Really. Mm -hmm. So, um, But this guy was obviously a supporter of... Yes, he was. So uh, as yeah. we'll find out a little bit later Ooh. when we have a look at the election certificate. This is seriously thorough yeah. science here and it looks like she's using lots of disciplines and... This is about the electric arc, and it seems it was quite a common form of lighting, but no one really understood it in detail. They would hiss and they would spark, and no one really knew how to do anything about it, so they just left, kind of left it. So, but she came up with the reasons why it did it and kind of how to fix it, basically. She was clearly a woman who knew her stuff. She was a top yes. scientist. So it's unsurprising that people thought perhaps she should be a fellow of the Royal Society, which is what happens when you're a top scientist. So we have mm -hmm. a nomination form here. Yes, let's take a look. Look what Keith found. This is fantastic. This is basically the little file in which Hertha Ayrton is being nominated. Ah, and she's been nominated. By the guy. She's been nominated by John Perry. That's right, yeah. There we go, the same, the same person who submitted her, her arc light paper. Here we see the certificate of a candidate for election. There's her name, and there's a nice write-up of who she is, what she's done, the little mini CV. Well, for a citation of this time, this is quite long and detailed. They're, they're clearly trying to make a point here. There are yeah, a bunch yeah. of people here saying, this woman's the real deal. We should have her as a fellow of the Royal Society. Yeah. What happened next? They took a legal opinion to see whether or not, within the charters, they could actually elect a woman. So we are of the opinion that married women are not eligible as fellows of the Royal Society. <laughs> I know, I know. Whether the charters admit of the election of unmarried women appears to us to be very doubtful. So there's even a, a, a distinction between married women, because they presumably are then considered to be the property of their husbands in a yeah. legal sense, and unmarried women. Uh, and even it's very, it's very interesting talking to um, women FRSs now, yeah. you know, the very start of their careers, quite often, you know, if you got married, you, were, you had to give up your job. So, so on legal advice, basically, yeah. she never became a fellow of the Royal Society. Can we, can we get this, yeah, next, sure. this next file, Keith? And this is where things start getting very interesting at the Royal Society, because now we have some documents over the years where the Royal Society is having to consider this a bit more seriously. Mm -hmm. People are starting to be displeased with this situation more vocally. 
And in fact, we have some great letters in this file from the Women's Engineering Society. And a, a woman named C. Hazlitt was writing some letters. Mm -hmm. She's been requested by her council at the Women's Engineering Society to ask whether women are eligible for admission as fellows of the Royal Society. Just it, ask him, just ask him for just, a friend. Just, just mm -hmm. ask him, yeah. if they have the necessary qualifications. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. She points out that there has been the passage into the law of the Sex Disqualification Removal Act, which obviously would yep. put the society yeah. in an interesting situation. And then she also asks, in a quite a friendly way, if she could have a list of all the members of the Council of the Royal Society, what she wants to do with such a list. Really? Who, who knows? She's going to crack out the email, start maybe. lobbying, yeah. right? Maybe, maybe. <laughs> And it's pretty clear from the resulting correspondence here what happens next. And that is the Royal Society realises, come on, we need to think about this again. We need to get new legal advice. And here's what the lawyers have said this time. In view of the Act, we consider that both single and married women are now eligible for fellowship under the Charters. Yes, and there is now no need for a supplementary charter to admit women. So well. you don't need to change the rules. Women can become fellows of the Royal Society. The first women were elected as fellows in 1945. Uh, so that's Only another 20 years! Yeah, I, I took another world war. Progress is, slow. Progress is slow. But Kathleen Lonsdale and Marjorie yeah. Stevenson became the first two women fellows of the Royal Society. And when you consider particularly that the kind of contributions that women had uh, made to the war effort, uh, it is remarkable that they waited yeah. that long. As a 17-year-old taking my A-levels in physics and maths and music and not, not being sure what to study, uh, I had no role models except Marie Curie. You know, it was really difficult to know about other women who, who haven't just been doing science in the last 40 years. You know, this is someone who 100 years ago was doing science and was doing the kind of science that I was into. And also was someone who wasn't so unassailably incredible as Marie Curie. And Marie Curie is kind of held up as this incredible scientist. I mean, if you don't win two Nobel Prizes, you're probably doing something wrong yeah. as a scientist. So that kind of frustration of thinking that I, you know, if I'm not as good as Marie Curie, why am I bothering? <laughs> Yeah. It sounds quite vain when I say it out loud, yeah. but, but because you've never heard of any of these other scientists who've been doing their thing this whole time and, and are more of a role model, in a sense, because they're kind of normal people. They're more like you. <laughs> I hope you found out a bit more about her and you feel like you know a bit more about her story. And I do. Maybe. I'm going to snaffle up her biography. Yeah, I think not that one, obviously. That belongs to Keith. I'm not mm -hmm. allowed to steal that. No, you can't take Keith's, but uh, <laughs> I'm sure you can find one. I'll find a copy somewhere. And finally, this is what half a million pounds would buy you. By Henri Regnier. It's a riverside scene in France, as you can see. Uh, it has a few boats in the foreground. There's a, a village on your right there. And it's simply a very beautiful image. Many years ago, found these in the Royal Society's archives wrapped up in the same brown paper wrapper that they'd been transferred here with the rest of Herschel's papers. Nobody had looked at them in all that time, and because they hadn't had any light exposure, of course, they'd been preserved beautifully.